Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the November 3rd, 2014 regular meeting. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Trustee Kruger. Here. Trustee Lang. Here. Trustee Brady. Here. Trustee Here. Here. Trustee Hine. Here. Trustee Vogel inform the board that he will not be here this evening and President Argeris. Here. Thank you. Entertain a motion to approve the minutes for the regular meeting of October 6th. So moved. Second. Motion by Trustee Lang. Second by Trustee Here. Roll call. Trustee Kruger. Yes. Trustee Lang. Yes. Trustee Brady. Yes. Trustee Here. Yes. Trustee Hine. Yes. President Argeris. Yes. Thank you. Any changes to the agenda? None this evening. Thank you. Citizens' concerns and comments? Members of the general public may address the board with concerns or comments regarding relevant issues. The person submitting a petition, concern, or other comment shall be allotted five minutes to present their points and should state their name and address into the record. Thank you. Mr. Heber? Good evening. I thank the trustees and President Argeris for giving me this chance to talk a little bit on the upcoming blood drive, which is going to be November 12th from 2 uh, p.m. until 7 p.m. I've been given a lot of names lately. Trustee Brady, he calls me Count George. <laughs> Mark, he calls me Count Dracula. Now, uh, Chief, ben uh, Chief McIsaac, he wanted me to wear a blood drop uniform, like that guy in Prospect. <laughs> Otherwise, I couldn't talk, he said, but I'm still talking. <laughs> that, uh, I, think, I thank everybody who comes to these blood drives. I mean, it's so darn important that people give blood. It, like I said, if one-third of eligible donors gave blood, we wouldn't have to worry about getting blood. You could go into the hospital and anywhere and get blood then. But the way it is today, you may have to wait until that hospital goes to another hospital to get the blood that you need. And that can be, it's time consuming. So that could be real nasty. But like I stated, the blood drive is going to be November 12th from 2 p.m. until 7 p.m. right here at 200 Community Boulevard. Now, Beverly, I'm sure you all know her, she went into the hospital for a foot operation, so she won't be attending. So to make an appointment, actually, to call Life Source, 877-543-3768. Oh, please, anybody that's eligible to come, Please come. It's it's really needed. And I thank everyone. I thank the board for giving me this opportunity to talk. And uh, God bless you all. Thanks, George. You're always there. Mr. Blood. <coughs> That's it. That's it? Consent agenda? All items listed on the consent agenda are considered to be routine by the village board and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a board member or citizen so requests in which event the item will be removed from the general order of business and considered after all agenda items. Thank you. Any concerns or questions? Entertain a motion. So no moved. Move. Motion by Trustee here, second by Trustee Hine. Roll call, please. Trustee Kruger? Yes. Trustee Lang? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. Trustee Heer? Yes. Trustee Hine? Yes. President Argeris? Yes. Staff reports, Community Development Director Janik. Thank you. Uh, most of our projects are uh, winding down for the year. That is uh, infrastructure projects. We do have a couple that are ongoing or, or they're about to start. Um, one is a water main project that's going to take place on Wolf Road just south of Dundee. That should take place uh, or start um, sometime this week, uh, hopefully um, Wednesday. Um, has to do with a water main that we're a new water main we're doing um, underneath Wolf Road and on both sides of uh, Wolf. 
Um, the second project is a um, grinding and repaving of Strong Street from Milwaukee Avenue to Wolf Road, and we believe that's going to start on Wednesday. Um, just warning you about uh, the, the Strong Street one on, um, in particular, just to avoid it if possible relative to uh, traffic issues. Okay. Any questions from anybody? Thanks, Mark. Good job on that, too. Real quick, I just want to check something with the attorney. We had an item 13A that uh, part of changes the agenda last week. It was pulled, so we don't need yeah, to. You don't have to remove it. Okay, just correct. wanted to double check. Thanks. That's correct. 13A, new business, Madam Clerk. Um, ordinance amending ordinance number 4796, which granted special use site plan and appearance approval for a sit down restaurant at 723 North Milwaukee Avenue, docket number PC 14 15. Thank you. Director Janik? Yes, uh, the petitioner is here tonight. Uh, he has an existing restaurant um, at the uh, Weston property, commonly known as the Weston property. It's uh, Spears Bourbon. And um, there's a change in the in the uh, the plan on the inside of the, the restaurant. There's an increase in the number of seats. Um, the plan commission reviewed this uh, with unanimous approval of it. Um, all it really is doing is uh, adding seats to an existing uh, restaurant. Um, it doesn't affect the parking issues um, at the site. Questions from the board? So moved. Second Motion by Trustee Brady. Second by Trustee Lang. Roll call, please. Trustee Kruger? Yes. Trustee Lang? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. Trustee Heer? Yes. Trustee Hine? Yes. President Arduris? Yes, thank you. Joe, how's things going? Good. Love a lot it. of activity over there. It's nice. Great, yeah. I understand you're doing a nice thing for Thanksgiving as well for the community, which I think Thanks is awesome. Come along. Brady said he's coming along, so. Good. You know, at least stop in. We will. So. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks for being part of the community. We appreciate All right. it. Thank you. Am I allowed to go? Yes, you are. <laughs> Get back to work. Go back to work. No, you have to stay. <laughs> oh, you got to stay through the whole thing. <laughs> That's punishment for not being here last week. <laughs> 13B, there are five ordinances. And I will read them all at one read time? Read them all at one time, please. All right, ordinance and four resolutions related to the Whitley Planned Unit Development, 60-156 West Dundee Road. Ordinance... Uh, the first one is an ordinance granting preliminary planned unit development special use site plan and building appearance approval for the Whitley planned unit development 60-156 <clears throat> West Dundee Road, docket number 2014-15. Resolution approving the preliminary plan of subdivision for the vacant Shir Hadash parcel, current address 156 West Dundee Road, docket number PC 14-17. Resolution approving the preliminary plat of subdivision for the vacant Whitley parcel, current address 60-100 West Dundee Road, docket number PC 14-18. Resolution approving the preliminary plat of consolidation for portions of the vacant Shur Hadassah parcels, current address 60100 and 156 West Dundee Road, docket number PC 14-19. Resolution approving the preliminary plan of consolidation for portions of the vacant Whitley parcels, current address 60100 and 156 West Dundee Road, docket number PC 14-20. Thank you. <laughs> Director Janik. Thank you. The petitioners are here tonight requesting approval of um, various um, resolutions and uh, ordinances relative to this use. Generally speaking, what's, uh, what's being proposed is uh, an assisted living use on approximately 4.75 acres of land uh, located on the north side of Dundee Road. Um, the petitioners have been uh, to the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission has uh, provided um, unanimous recommendation for this use. Um, this is a, uh, a, a building, a three-story building, uh, with 102 assisted living units in it. Um, there is um, uh, consolidation and um, uh, provision of property to Shuradash as part of this project. Uh, basically, um, part of part of the um, um, the Whitley, I'll call it the, the Whitley property, is being um, provided to Shuradash in exchange for access agreements and uh, working together on on taking care of the property uh, between them. Uh, the petitioners are here tonight. There are some slides that they probably want to do some presentation on, um, but there are numerous um, resolutions as you can see. 
Um, generally speaking, it's a, it's a preliminary plat and special use approval tonight. Mark, there are eight conditions, I believe. Want to read them for the record so we have them? Yeah. <coughs> Just one second. Okay, uh, number one, that the shuttle van is to be kept in the rear parking area. Number two, that the flagpole area plan must be provided for review, or excuse me, that the flagpole, flagpole area plan must be provided for review prior to installation, that the new path easement is to be modeled after the easement for the west path with the path to be installed during construction of the building. That path would be the path along the the, uh, the creek uh, to the rear, to the north of the property. Okay. Number four, that the path bollards are to be replaced with no motorized vehicle signage if required by the Public Works Department. Number five, that the eastern wooded areas be cleaned up as needed to remove dead or potentially dangerous trees. Number six, that a single bike rack is added to the Dundee Road side of the building. Number seven, that the wall-mounted light shown on the presentation slides is submitted for inclusion with the lighting exhibits. And number eight, that the shade tree caliber is increased to meet the code standard. Okay, thank you. Petitioners, you want to come forward? Thanks. State your name, please. Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Meacher, um, 415 Florida Blanco, and this is in Pensacola, Florida, 32301. Um, as mentioned, we're attempting to uh, develop, build, and operate this 102 unit uh, or bed facility. And uh, it's a combination of regular assisted living, which most people understand, but also a memory care unit, which is one of our specialties. The company has quite a bit of experience in this area. We're going on 20 years now. Uh, we have properties uh, all over Texas, which is where the parent company is, um, in Atlanta, now starting in uh, Florida, but we have 10 properties here in the Chicago land area. Um, our previous projects have been smaller, specialized ones. This one will be a larger project for us, but it seems to be the right use for the property. Um, company is family owned and I would have you take away that we own properties and there's no intent uh, to sell some transfers amongst family members is all that we expect to go on. I wanted to mention a couple of things beyond just what's in the, the documents that you've read. I put a letter in your package that referred to some of these. Um, this property is uh, uh, severely constrained by a flood, uh, a flood way, not just a flood plain. And in looking at how we could design the property, we ran into a problem trying to do handle our on-site storage of uh, stormwater. And um, something on the order of half a million dollars to do that would make our project infeasible. Um, one of the things that we'd like you all to consider is to help us with our off, with offsite compens sorry compensatory uh, storage at village facilities, and we offer to uh, say if, if you approve this request, we won't ask for any TIF funding. Um, the second thing that we are involved in in this project is that we have um, four parcels. Well, I should say we start with two parcels. We have to subdivide those. But we end up with all of the frontage along Dundee and all the property in the back will be Shiradashes. It's all in the floodway. They have a plan for park-like improvements. We've volunteered uh, to help uh, install those improvements. And in addition to that, uh, we're proffering to pave the bike path that we've been identifying as a future bike path but I think it's come out in enough places that we think we have to go ahead and do that. Um, there are other paths and other things on the site plan. Uh, all of these things are on the Shiradas property. I want you to think of it as um, park-like improvements. Okay, there are trails. There's a flattened out area that they can install a tent temporarily. 
There are some garden areas. And the only thing to be aware of is that because it's a floodway, there are a lot of restrictions on what we're able to do in those areas. Uh, we're mindful of that. The plan is still evolving a little bit, but we've committed our dollars for this. The second thing that we have um, an issue with, and it's, um, it's something that has been going on in discussion at a couple of different levels, has to do with emergency response. Our emergency response needs will be higher than a typical residential neighborhood because our average resident is going to be about 85 years old. We recognize that it's very hard to determine if this property would have more than a acceptable number of calls. And whether you know it or not, there's a deficit between what this costs to provide and what Medicare reimburses. We've looked at the studies both by the uh, village engineer and our own, and it looks like uh, the fire department would have to projected about a 48 calls per year based on the historic experience with four similar properties. And we think that we can live with less than that. We originally thought 40 would fit us, but that's at the high end of our average for our properties, and we believe that we can live with 30. Uh, the write-up that you have that came from the Planning Commission said 40. What would happen is that at the end of the year, we would determine what that net difference is, and we would pay that amount to the village. This reduces a risk which had mentioned to me originally it would be a, a de facto subsidy by the village to us if there were excessive calls. Uh, these are just the outstanding issues. There are some nice things to tell you about the property, but I'd like to have my architect take a little bit of time to do that. And then, of course, we're available for questions. Thank you. Manager Svandilis first. Uh, thank you. I'd just like to address those two items, the emergency response as well as the uh, compensatory storage, just so that the board understands. Uh, before you tonight are all preliminary considerations, and the village president actually has some language that he'll read when it's time to make a motion to approve. So what I, what I, what I wanted to say to the board is that uh, because these are preliminary, staff is still working on one coming up with uh, the right balance for the emergency response subsidy, to use your words. Um, so that is not something that needs to be finalized this evening. And I would ask, and in fact, it's in the motion itself, that you give us a little time uh, to figure that out. That's one. And two, the other is consideration for compensatory storage. Uh, the board discussed this about a month and a half ago. Um, as everyone knows, we own some acre footage back here in Heritage Park. What we have not settled on is a cost for an acre foot. Um, staff is in the middle of trying to pinpoint what that number should be for the board's consideration, and we will bring that back to you uh, in the near future for your blessing as to what is the village going to charge for an acre foot. From there, whether it's this project or any other project, we can determine how much 0.6 acre feet would be. Um, because there's a, there's a time gap between preliminary and final, we don't think that that's, that work is going to interfere with this project moving forward. I just wanted to get ahead of any questions to let the board know that both of those things are currently being worked on and that we will be coming back to you, one, with uh, a discussion of the overall price for an acre foot of compensatory storage, and two, uh, with a final uh, emergency response um, plan. Okay. Hi. Okay. Your name, please. Yep. My name is Jim Moyer. I'm a partner with SAS Architects and Planners. We're located at 630 Dundee Road in Northbrook, just down the street here. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I've, we've been working with LaSalle Group for a while. We do primarily all senior care, and we've done all the assisted living memory support for LaSalle Partners over the last eight years. So I'd like to just quickly talk about the design of this building. Um, this building is obviously located right across the street. It's a, a three-story assisted living building. 
Um, there's 64 assisted living apartments and and um, memory support on the first floor. Uh, the most important thing about the site is it's a difficult site to build on. Um, there's a floodway that roughly goes about halfway through the site. And north of this and east of that towards the creek is unbuildable. You can't build any structures and you can't modify the topography. We could only fit parking in there. So we're really limited to the southern portion of the site, uh, hence uh, the shape of this building. Uh, there are two access drives to the site, uh, one on the west side that's an existing drive that will be widening. Um, there's another one that will be on the east side that will be the main entrance to the site. Um, there is a sign that will identify that entrance. We have an access road that goes around the building and it includes parking. Uh, about a third of the parking on the south here is for visitors and for residents. Uh, about a third on the northeast corner is for employees and another third in the northwest corner would be for overflow parking and shared parking with the synagogue. Uh, the service access to the building is on the south side and when we were designing this building we were trying to be very careful that you know there is potential that the site could flood so we have all the emergency exits coming out of the building on the north side as well as service to the building would be on the, I'm sorry, on the south side of this building um, so that if it did flood that uh, vehicles wouldn't have to traverse through the uh, flooded waters. Uh, there's also a, an eight foot screen wall with a land, a four foot landscape berm that screens that service drive. There are two entrances to the property. The south entrance is the main entrance to the assisted living. There's another entrance to, on the north side that is the main entrance to the memory support. Um, there is a generator that's located right here in the, in the northeast corner, I think in another iteration that might be flipping, but right now it's on the northeast corner and it has an eight foot screen around it with materials that are the same as the building. And then there's also a maintenance building here that is a one story with materials that are similar to the uh, this building. All the utilities will come in through this service area, the transformer, uh, the trash enclosures located here, it's all screened behind the wall. Moving on to the floor plan, it's a little bit hard to see. Uh, the, so the first floor is a commons area for the assisted living. This is a one-story building. Um, it has the main dining room and living room and some administrative offices. Also the back of the house is located here, the main kitchen and mechanical rooms. And then there's elevator banks that take you up to the second and third floor. And then the north side of this building is the memory support. There's two neighborhoods of 15 and it's a secured uh, memory support facility and everything they need is in there. They have uh, living rooms and dining rooms and activity areas. Uh, there's a greenhouse. And then there's two secured gardens that they can access, um, come out on, on a nice day. The residents would be able to go out there with a eight foot, it's a six foot high fence on either side. Uh, the second and third floors are all assisted living apartments, uh, 32 per floor. There's a little bit of a south wing above this area. That on the second floor would be a fitness center, OTPT, and then on the third floor it becomes multi-purpose space for parties and bingo and that kind of use. Um, so on the elevations, um, so we're very sensitive about the massing of this building. We didn't want to have a three-story building that was parallel to Dundee Road. We wanted a, the three-story to recede into the background and then we have a one-story element in front of it to kind of soften that three-story wall. We also added multiple bays uh, to give it some architectural character and to break up the facade and also create some shade and shadow on the, on the building. In terms of architectural character, LaSalle met with the village early on and they wanted us to explore a, a prairie style architecture so we used that um, in the design and we have uh, low sloped hip roofs with wide overhangs and a lot of large amounts of glass casement windows. Horizontal bands that add a, a sense of horizontality um, that's typical of the prairie school. So these are the elevations and then we have some blow ups that show uh, the trash enclosure which will be screened uh, with a composite wood material behind a fence. This is a generator elevation. Um, there'll be brick piers at the corners, the same brick as the building and then a composite wood uh, material that screens a generator and then this is the maintenance building that has a similar, similar architectural character and materials that are similar to the building or are the same as the building. 
In terms of materials, uh, we wanted to go with earth tones, uh, natural materials that are consistent with the Prairie School architecture. The base of the building is a natural stone um, in a cream tan color. Uh, the majority of the facade is, is a face brick that's a brown, red, orange blend that goes nicely with the stone. Uh, there's some cement siding that we're using to help accent some of the bays, to define the bays on the building, and that will be in a tan color. Uh, the roof will be a fiberglass shingle roof to give it some residential character. The color will be a weathered wood. There's some standing seam metal roofs. It just It's like an aged copper color just to give it a little color at the first floor. And then the windows are an almond color. We didn't want to go with a bright white, but something more subtle that blends in with the earth tone materials. And we have a bronze fence for the security area, and then some Prairie School fixtures that are on the building, around the entrances, and then the parking lot lighting is just a very simple light. Uh, we didn't want to draw a lot of attention to it or cause glare for the residents, so it just shines down, simple fixture. Um, the, the landscape architect's not here tonight, but just quickly, um, we have a, a hedge that goes along the property line here that will screen the front of the cars and block the headlights from the cars. Uh, there's a berm along this retaining wall with some evergreen trees to screen the maintenance area. Uh, part of LaSalle Partners and Autumn Leaves, they, they like to add seasonal flowers around entrances, so there'll be a lot of color annual flowers. Um, at the ends of the building, we've screened the ends of the building with some evergreens to, to soften the ends of the building. And then this heavy dashed line represents where the irrigation will be for the property and the landscaping. The north portion of the site is a design that's been developed with the synagogue. And it'll be primarily prairie grasses. Um, there are some garden bend, beds where they could plant uh, pr produce, vegetables. There's an orchard. And then the eastern portion of the site uh, will be the existing trees, but they'll be cleared out, not cleared out, but thinned and pruned. Um, so that's about it. If uh, Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Trustee Brady. Thank you. <clears throat> of the uh, units you have in there, the memory rooms uh, all seem to be single single beds, with, uh, with the exception of a few of them. What is the mix between the, the, the different, uh, uh, the other, the, the care end of it and the... Uh, memory end of it. You got single rooms, double rooms. Would you ask the part of the question again? Uh, the well, between what the memory, memory floor, which is the first floor, I, I presume, uh, you've got just a few double rooms uh, and the rest of them all just single and there's no cooking apparently. So you pretty much take care of the, 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 the people with the memory problems. Yeah, well, because we're all private pay and the units are expensive, um, there will be occasions for some folks who will want to double up to save money. But it doesn't happen that much in our business. Uh, the families are very concerned about this individual and the quality of their life and uh, have generally in our practice now we're up to 32 projects that we just don't need the additional shared units. It's just not a desired way that people live. Uh, the spaces that we provide for the memory care units are smaller than we would for assisted living. In assisted living, it is pretty close to an apartment. Not quite, it's a reduced kitchen, uh, spaces, you know, relatively limited. But because we're providing meals and entertainment and other things on the site, we really want them to come out of their apartments. So we haven't invested a lot of uh, space there, but they're half again the size of the memory care units. Okay, and, and one last thing. Uh, in, in all cases here, there's got to be a point where, where these people move beyond the aid that you can give them. And, and, and do you determine that, or does their doctor determine that? If they First of all, there are constant assessments going on, um, certainly with the memory care people, because it's a very serious issue, and we're with them so much more intensely. But with even the assisted living, um, the evaluations are multiple ones, but the one that I think that you'll be speaking to is their medical conditions. This is assisted living, and based upon uh, licensing that we have, we will not be able to keep people who have uh, 
more intense medical needs. We provide things like, um, we'll, we'll do shots, of course we manage the meds, um, oxygen occasionally, but beyond that, if something happens to them, they will have to leave and move to probably nursing home, possibly rehab hospital. Right. I, I tell you, it, it's, it's a, a, a very good, good thing you're doing here. Uh, I had an uncle, in, he was in the city, and it was a, more or less a, a little bit more in, in, involved because he moved in there. He was in fairly good shape, and as he progressed, little by little, they had to keep it, and it was almost turned into, uh, they were nursing him, you know. Yeah, it, the idea, at least with assisted living, is to create a community where there's, you don't have the lonely person in their house that they fight to stay in. But it's just fine, it becomes time for them to leave. And then they find that there are new friends, and there are things to do, and we feel it enriches their lives instead of making it institutional-like. Do you have social uh, uh, directors that, that give you know, activities for them to keep keep them busy, keep monitor rooms, doing things? Yeah, and the programs are different between memory uh, support and the regular assisted. Uh, you will find almost every brochure for regular assisted living Lots of things in there about very active lifestyle. But most of that material and the research says that it's 20 years old. Now what happens, the people come to us when they finally give up their house. They've got too many things they need support with. And mid-80s is a typical age for us, usually female, of course, high proportion. And it's a lot more limited. It's a lot more tame, but we do try to keep them moving. And we provide a bus on the side. We'll be taking them to, you know, the user ones are to Kmart or Walmart and grocery store and that kind of thing. We can arrange to take people to medical appointments, but we're not driving off to the opera for the most part. Okay. One last thing. It's a serious thing, but it's something that we're not going to, I probably won't see it, but uh, the state keeps threatening to widen Dundee Road. Uh, you know, we've been kind of more or less trying to get extra, you know, easement when we can. And I think what's happened here is, is probably to the good because when they put the bridge in, they grabbed more and you see the sidewalk doesn't run, you know, parallel to your property. It kind of runs a little off straight east and west. Uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, your parkway on the uh, west side is quite a bit, looks like another 12, 15 foot wider, which is would be the, the amount of property that the state is looking for. So there might be a day when there might be some changes out in front of your place there. As long as it doesn't affect your parking, I don't see any problem with you, you know. Yes, actually uh, we're well over parked and that's why we were able to make available 32 spaces on our property for our Shiradasha's use. And that's a permanent easement and uh, their right to use those for uh, their expansion of the synagogue over time. Our residents will not be very mobile. Um, even those who are still able to drive, have licenses, uh, are not sure of themselves and tend to stop driving, but they probably won't get rid of the car. But we're not expecting more than 20 or 30 cars. None in the memory care unit, and then a very limited number uh, in assisted living. Our principal parking and the changes uh, the traffic it generates are in shift changes, and our staffing's in the 20 at a time. And that's about all the cars we'll see. Very few visitors, except when we have a special event. We can always make arrangements with your neighbor there to share. Right. Okay. Now, we have worked out with Shiradash um, an agreement that allows us, with prior notice and approval, to handle overflow parking when we have an event, their space, and they can do the same with us. It's useful for us because there are, you know, Mother's Day, Christmas things. There are times when we want to have the families down and we don't want them parking out on the grass or on the street or there's something no, like There's no other place around there. I mean, you can't park on the street, is right. <laughs> right. Okay, Well, it, it was something that was mentioned to us very early on by um, the village engineer that this is something that he's noticed is a problem when those events take place on the other properties you have like this. So this turned out to be a really fortunate thing for us. Good. Thank you.
Trustee Kruger? That's it. Questions? Um, I, I don't have any questions. I just have a comment, Mr. Meacher. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I really like the design of the building. I like the um, just the collaborative spirit between you and your next door neighbors and what you're planning to do in the floodway. I just think that's a, a, an impressive way to do business with one another. And, uh, well, considering that we had this floodway behind us that was of no use to us, and there was a desire on the part of Shirdash to do some things, and it is principally for uh, their memberships, but we have easements now planned for us to be able to use it as well. And of course, the bike path, which we've now committed to build, um, will allow public access across the property. But our residents are gonna go out and look at flowers and do things. They're not gonna be actively right. planting and working in their proposed garden areas. They're just going to be visiting. It's still making uh, lemonade out of lemons. And, right. And, uh, yeah, we would do something within our own patio, our uh, uh, enclosed areas by, at the rear of the property for raised bed kind of, you know, fooling with soils and stuff. They're just not going to get on their knees and work right. the garden. Oh, very good. That's all. That's all. Trustee here. Yes, thank you. I'm glad that you're addressing the emergency response issue with the, with the village as well. But I do want to compliment you. I watched you on the Planning Commission when you appeared before them, and I read the material that you provided us. And every time you speak, you always speak like you're, you're very well prepared. I mean, you come across, and we've had many developers come in front of this village board, but you come across as an honest individual, the way you speak and the way you respond back to the questions that are posed to you, and I do want to compliment you on that. Thank you. Well, part of this comes from the fact that I think other people might say the same thing. There are very few of us who haven't uh, found ourselves now wrestling with this problem. Maybe not Alzheimer's, but certainly what to do to care for parents and things. Both my mother and my uh, mother-in-law both had Alzheimer's, and we went through that experience, and we went through it by putting her in the best property we could find, which was a Marriott property. Well, Marriott has since gotten out of the business, and they finally realized it's not just hospitality. There's a lot more that goes into it. But, you, I mean, you, you, you just speak that for the residents. You, you're concerned about their well-being, and I appreciate that. And I'm, and I'm just the tip of the iceberg. You ought to see what the folks do who provide the care. Well, I look forward to maybe not experiencing it first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't want to invite you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Trustee here. Hi. Thank you. I'm going to wait on my comments until I have the uh, uh, reports back from staff relative to the offsite storage and the uh, <clears throat> the use of our ambulance service. And uh, uh, I'll wait to the final plan. Thank you, Trustee Lang. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to echo the rest of the, what the rest of the board is saying. Uh, the building design is fantastic. That property has been vacant forever, and uh, it's really going to make a uh, uh, Im huge improvement in that piece of property, both for the design of the building and the, the use. Uh, great Thank you. Use for and although the property owners didn't know it, especially the Oshanskis, they were coming up on a time that they may not be able to build that site because of changes in the stormwater requirements. They were above the five acres that were going to really cause them problems. Yeah. That, so that area has always been in motion with, with water, yeah. so to speak. So, uh, but, but the, and also working with the, uh, the synagogue is fantastic. You're, you know, you're well, we really had an, improved We've that had area. interesting exchanges, especially with the lawyers and things. <laughs> However, uh, an interesting comment came out of the last series of conversations I was in. We, both sides here, each of us, think that we're going to be good neighbors. There are details to work out in this plan that causes some friction, but I believe we really are going to be good neighbors and it's going to be enjoyable between us. You know, most of what we have is a lookout out the back, a look at, but it's going to be well maintained. And, you know, from my perspective, it's, it's like getting a free park in the backyard. Exactly. 
Well, if you put up a fence, if you uh, pull a permit for a fence, we know there's a problem. <laughs> Thank you. I know a fence was mentioned at one point, and that just wouldn't fit us. <clears throat> Thank you. And hey, Mr. President, may I say one sure. last thing? I do want to see the golfing in the hallways like Commissioner Steiler wanted you to put up there. <laughs> that was a good idea. <laughs> that was a good idea. <clears throat> yeah, that's Thank all you need. I just want to ask a couple of quick questions. Based on your projections, the increment that you think you'd be generating in real estate taxes, your, based on your projections, what do you think that number will be a year on that site, actually, after it's fully developed? And I have to admit that I have a hearing problem, so I didn't hear the question well enough. I'm sorry. The increment that's going to be generated in real estate taxes on that site after it's fully developed, do you uh, have an idea what dollar amount that might be? Um, based on your yes, performance? Yes, it's on the order of $500,000 a year. Okay. Compared to what um, we're paying now, there, nothing. And that was a surprise to us. Yes. We have worked in many other counties, and uh, but not here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I took a previous project when I was first working out the numbers. And I, this is a larger scale, so I took the larger scale, I did the math, and I came up about $50,000 a year short, so. <laughs> eh, there's little nicks everywhere you go. Sure. <laughs> the best day I ever have is the day that I set up the budget the first time. <laughs> best day, huh? First time, huh? Yeah. And number of employees, I think you touched based on it earlier. What do yeah, you think? and what I may get my numbers off from what we put in the tabulation, but we generally have 24 people on staff uh, during the first two shifts. The third shift, the overnight shift, drops down uh, to 12 to 15. And those are uh, aides that are normally helping people as they move them you know, through the building and do other things. So, um, but it still it provides employment base. And uh, as you said, we pay taxes. Yeah. Uh, the only thing that you know we hope is recognized is that by not uh, asking for TIF funds, that you can take seriously our need to take the stormwater offsite. Mm -hmm. And you'll work that out with staff. Just a quick note: your landscape architect isn't here, but you do have a lot of landscaping along the Dundee Road corridor there. We get some nasty winters here with salt, so you may want to remind him to come up with some kind of program that you protect the shrubs and along Dundee Road, so you're not replacing them every year. So those would be salts and other things. Right, okay. but even so, it's, uh, we've had a hard winter here, and the salt yeah. beats everything up. You know, we talk about Alzheimer and memory care. Uh, unfortunately, my family's going through that right now, and it's tough. I got a mother-in-law who's not that old, 79 years old. That, uh, that's a bit young. That's a bit young, and it's, uh, it hit hard, it, and it's, it's been tough. It's been tough on... Uh, not just for her, but my wife, her family. And uh, to, to find a facility now where we need to really take care of her uh, is hard. They're not out there. And, uh, my mother was a very distinctive woman, uh, very careful with her appearance her whole life. Oh, I know. And if she knew we put her in a, you know, a uh, warm-up suit near the end because it was easier to get her in and out of them, she would have died. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> I can relate to that because I have to deal with that in heaven. <laughs> I can relate to that because my mother-in-law was the same way. Anybody that knew her, she was always meticulous in her, her appearance, her hair, her, her the way she dressed, and the way she was is, and it's uh, it's hard. It's very hard. I met with uh, the LaSalle group over a year ago with our staff, and we had a, a f phone call that I received from the, the fellows from LaSalle, and we had a meeting here, and it was, you know, an idea and a thought by then. And one of the things that I had asked. And, and I'm so happy that they did, was to reach out to the synagogue. Because I thought, what a great opportunity here to really do a community thing there for an area that is blighted, it's hard to build on because of the restrictions, and make something that not just the synagogue and the new facility, they can utilize together and come together as a group. And you guys made that happen. Sure, you hit some bumps, I'm sure, but you know what? At <laughs> well, the I, end, I think it's going to be a good And I will tell you, on the plan that you see here, um, we had not established the property lines when we started working on this overall plan. And we took it to heart that it was the whole thing, as if, because it's a plan development, you want to see how all those other things happen. Um, we're adjusting it a little bit, but it comes down to just moving some trails back onto their property. 
uh, instead of having to wonder whether you know we'll take care of our part of it, but they feel it's part of their walks. So a little bit of a modification there, but that'll go into the planning commission and we're ready to turn this around and go. Good. Our aim is to try to get through enough steps to close before the end of the year. Um, and if we succeed in that, we're not going to do much until spring. Right. But there are financial reasons for trying to close it this year and then set up a trailer and do some scraping of the ground, but not much else until spring when the concrete plants come back online. I think the consensus, as you heard tonight, is uh, we want to see you move forward. I think this is a, a good positive step towards the new streetscape that we're looking along Dundee Road with our downtown area and everything, and it, it's a natural fit. It works well. So if there aren't any more questions, I'd like to entertain a motion for 13B1 to approve an ordinance granting preliminary planned unit development special use site plan building and appearance approval for the Whitney planned unit development at 60-156 West Dundee Road conditioned upon the following occurring prior to the village's approval of the final planned unit development. One, the resolution, resolution to the village's satisfactory of the contribution amount that the developer will make to the general fund annually to cover the cost of village ambulance service to the development. And number two, an agreement between the village and the developer as to the amount of the Heritage, Heritage Lake acre feet that will be allocated to the development for comp compens <laughs> I'm doing the same thing. Compensatory. <laughs> Compensatory, excuse me, storage and the cost for said acre feet that will be reimbursed to the village. So moved. Second. Mo motion by Trustee Brady, second by Trustee Hare. Roll call. Trustee Kruger? Yes. Trustee Lang? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. Trustee here? Yes. Trustee Hine? Yes. President Argeris? Yes, thank you. Entertain a motion for 13B2, or it's a resolution approving the preliminary plot of subdivision for the vacant Shur Hadish parcel, current address 156 West Dundee Road, docket number PC 14-17. So a, moved. Motion by Trustee Kruger? A second. Second by Trustee Lang. Roll call, please. Trustee Kruger? Yes. Trustee Lang? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. Trustee Heer? Yes. Trustee Hine? Yes. President Arturis? Yes. Entertain a motion for 13B3. It's a resolution approving the preliminary plot of subdivision for the vacant Whitley parcel, current address 60 100 West Dundee Road, docket number PC 14 18. So I'll move. Second. Motion by Trustee Hine. Second by Trustee Kruger. Roll call, please. Trustee Kruger? Yes. Trustee Lang? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. Trustee Heer? Yes. Trustee Hine? Yes. President Arturis? Yes. Entertain a motion for 13B4. It's a resolution approving a preliminary plot of consolidation <coughs> for portions of the vacant Shurhadash parcels, current address 60 156 West Dundee Road, docket number PC 14 19. So moved. Motion by Trustee Heer? Second. Second by Trustee Kruger. Roll call, please. Trustee Kruger? Yes. Trustee Lang? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. Trustee Heer? Yes. Trustee Hine? Yes. President Argeris? Yes. 13B5, resolution approving the preliminary plot of consolidation for portions of the vacant Whitley parcel, current address 60, 100, and 156 West Dundee Road, docket number PC 14-20. So moved. Motion by Trustee Brady. Second. Second by Trustee here. Roll call, please. Trustee Kruger? Yes. Trustee Lang? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. Trustee here? Yes. Trustee Hine? Yes. President Argeris? Yes. Thank you. Gentlemen, good luck. Thank you. 13C, Madam Clerk. Uh, discussion regarding Northwest Pressure Zone. Measures Fandolas. Thank you. I'm happy this evening to begin a discussion on a topic that has been um, before you for a number of years, in fact, we, looking back in our records, can find the beginnings of this discussion going back about 25 years, uh, and that topic is the Northwest Pressure Zone. Um, as you know, there's a, there's a fairly significant project happening on Lake Cook Road that we knew would be the appropriate opportunity for us should we need to actually move forward with the Northwest Pressure Zone, we would need to do so in conjunction with that project. So over the last several months, staff has been reevaluating what 
we had previously considered a shovel-ready project, and it is. It's been studied, and it's been designed, and it's been sitting on a shelf, and we've talked about, well, where is this Northwest Pressure Zone project? And it had always come down to money. We simply didn't have funding. The project was somewhere in the upper $8 million price tag range, and there were reasons that uh, staff and the board have been talking about this idea of the Northwest Pressure Zone project for so long. And therefore, when we were evaluating where are we with this, what is the necessity for it, and has that necessity changed, we had to make sure that we incorporated the original reasons into our own analysis of whether this is still an appropriate project or not. Uh, and what you're going to hear, I'm going to introduce just in a moment, uh, Director Stavros, who's going to go into a little bit of the history about what, you know, what is the Northwest Pressure Zone, how did we get here, uh, and then turn it over to Mike Weingard to get into more of the details about the decision of where we're at. But the four main topics of this decision and this analysis are, um, well, what changed? What was the original reason that we needed or thought we needed a northwest pressure zone? And then what changed? Uh, two, is there enough pressure with our existing system to deal with our current residents? Because originally this was a discussion about development, but secondary but equally as important to that is, well, that portion of our community, how is their water pressure? And was this a project that was going to improve their water pressure? Three was specific to development. Without doing the project, can we still develop in what would have been the boundaries of the Northwest pressure zone? And four, are there other options? Um, 25 years has passed. There are different milestones for water consumption. There are different technologies that are both available and in place. Things, a lot has changed in the last 25 years. Therefore, our expectations need to change, our projections need to change, and ultimately, I will tell you the end of the story is staff is going to recommend that the board simply say, we agree that the Northwest Pressure Zone is not something that we need to consider an active project. That's the question that's really before you tonight. There's nothing that you need to um, decide on as far as money or as far as any engineering. This is a project that we have designed and is sitting on a shelf. What we have done is decide or, or analyze, I'm sorry, whether or not that still needs to be an active project. Is it still something that sits in the unfunded section of the CIP? Or can we make this presentation to you and you all decide that, well, after hearing the facts as they stand today and with the tools available to us currently to analyze the situation now and in the future, is this really something we even need to consider an active project? And we would recommend that that answer is no, uh, but of course that, that decision is a policy call for the board, but I will tell you that um, staff is very happy with this analysis. Uh, it was a nearly $10 million project that we believe we can, um, the service we can provide through existing means without spending any of that money in the best case scenario, worst case scenario, you'll hear a little bit about what technologies are in place should a problem arise in the future, what we can do and what some of those costs are, and I can tell you that those costs are substantially lower than what previously was put together as the Northwest Pressure Zone Package. So with that introduction, I'll turn it over to Public Works Director Stavros, who will give us a little bit of a background so that everyone understands what we are uh, talking about when we say the Northwest Pressure Zone. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Good evening. Well, back in the early, middle 80s, early 80s, uh, the village of William got lake water. Uh, as you all know, uh, prior to that, we were on wells, and it was a nightmare. Well, uh, sometime in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, the village of Wheeling decided we really didn't need to take a look at what we were doing here because now we had lake water, 
we had um, we had uh, contracted to uh, Rust in Engineering, who was doing at the time our, uh, our our pumping stations designs, like South Station down there on Willow Road. They were doing the design down there yet. Uh, they were doing some of the internal uh, uh, evaluations of the system, but they didn't have the whole system, and we needed to have a, a whole system evaluated. So in 92, the village uh, decided to hire them and bring them on board and do a complete water system uh, and do the in input into the computers, which they did. This model included the characteristics of the water system, including length, diameters of water meaning we had in the ground, ground surface elevations, sources and supply and demand. The model was initially used to, help, uh, to evaluate the existing water distribution system, the characteristics and to identify the potential deficiencies with respect to pressure and flow capacities. <clears throat> the information was used when putting together what we call the water system master plan. In general, as the customer demands and flows go up, water pressures decrease. It's just in fact the way it is. Because our system operates by gravity, our tanks are elevated. We have elevated tanks, systems of gravity. Areas that have higher topographic elevations, such as out west, the western elevations, out in the northwest, out northwest of town, this, uh, those are likely less to have less pressure. A 1992 study identified that no areas in the village experienced water pressures below the minimum requirement of 35 psi. However, pressures in the western areas, there were some areas that were below 40 psi. It was recommended that these areas be developed into what they called at the time a northwest west pressure zone. It would be a high pressure zone area. And which would boost the pressures up to above 40 psi. And what they did back then was because they were looking at future development at the time, back in 92. Um, Walmart, I believe, was just coming in. Uh, Target hadn't been in yet. Uh, there, was, there was a lot of uh, development that hadn't taken place yet out west. So they were, they, they were, they were looking on the, on the uh, projections on the come. In 98, the village contracted Russ again infrastructure to update the water system master plan. The plan was identified that the village's current water system at the time and required that the improvements were not <clears throat> would be necessary for future growth. In 98, they said, you need to get a, a high pressure zone out there and get it designed and get it built. All this time, Russ at the time, during the, all this time, had, des, had, was, had designed um, part of the system, our system as we have today, uh, when they had designed the South Station, Pumping Station, Central Station, these, they had designed transmission mains to be installed between those two towers, standpipes, uh, which were put in not until like uh, uh, probably uh, 95. So, I mean, those were plans that they had designed 20 years ago. But those were plans that they had put in place to help um, boost the uh, system up. So, <clears throat> the initial report outline recommended that the Northwest Pressure Zone and then 2000, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself here. In 2000, we, con we contracted out to AECON and to do a, prepare a design basis report for the Northwest Water uh, Pressure Zone. The initial report outlined and recommended the improvements for the Northwest Pressure Zone. And since 2000, it's been updated every couple of years. <clears throat> Tonight, I have Mike Weingart here from AECON and he's going to explain to you where we're at today. And Mike? Thanks, Tony. Thanks. Um, the, the mouse is moving around here. Left, left click. There you go. Okay. 
Uh, real quick, I've uh, made this presentation to this group uh, in 2006 and 2007. As Tony uh, talked about, uh, the whole purpose of this was what was discovered in the late 90s about the areas of the north, west, and west areas. At one time, there were going to be a northwest area and a west area, and then in the early 2000s, it was decided to combine them into one, hence the greater northwest pressure zone. And basically, the way this is going to work is, because of the way you're set up with the Northwest Water Commission, all the water comes into the east part of town, and that was going to be the main pressure zone. And then we we're going to create a second pressure zone to the northwest, and then boost the water so that the northwest, where the elevations are higher, would have a higher pressure of water. So when I gave this presentation in 2006 and 2007, that purpose there, that was our purpose back then, was we were almost done. There's still some land issues, mainly along Lake Cook Road we needed. And also come up with a timeline, how were we going to fund this? And also at the time, it looked like we needed more water. So we did get a, a allocation with more water. So at this time, back around 2006, these were the areas <coughs> in the village that thought the thought was we're going to develop. And the main one there was the uh, 85 acres to the northwest. And that green dotted line was the boundaries of the northwest pressure zone. So again, once again, we're going to take the water. Everything comes in at the three connection points from the Northwest Water Commission. It'll be in the, the main system there, the east side. And then we'll pump it over to the west northwest area to have a higher pressure. Um, in conclusion, in 2007, we said that, again, we needed to come up with a timeline and that we needed land acquisition for the proposed elevated tank. Where are we going to get the money to build this? What's our schedule? And get more water from IDNR, which we were able to obtain. So recently, again, staff had us look at this and say, hey, if we don't build this, how much water do we have in that northwest area? Uh, how, much, how much development can we do? So again, as Tony alluded, that the 10 state standards requires a minimum pressure of 35 PSI. The majority of the pressure in the village right now is about 50 PSI. So we said, OK, at the highest point in town, in the middle of those 85 acres, if we are going to limit ourselves to 35 PSI, 35 pounds, how much flow do we have for that northwest area. And based on the demands where we are right now, we have about a half a million gallons a day that we can utilize uh, for that northwest area. We said, OK, what happens if we put all those improvements in, the $10 million of improvements, how much will we have there? And that's that second column there, 2.8 million gallons per day. So by doing these improvements, it gives you 2.3 million gallons a day. But right now, there's no demand for that right now. So then the village asked us, OK, with the half a million gallons a day, what can you do? And you can see here, we can develop those 85 acres with almost anything except high density residential and still be at about a half a million gallons a day. So unless you know, a big Coca-Cola bottling plant goes in there, or a brewery, or some other big water user, it appears that there is sufficient water right now to do, you know, uh, normal development. So our conclusion was that just like everybody else, the water demand in uh, Wheeling has gone down tremendously. I was at the Northwest Water Commission this morning on another matter. They have told me that the demand for the entire commission, the, the four members, Wheeling, Arrington Heights, Buffalo Grove, and Palatine, has decreased by 33% in the last few years. And we're seeing that. I do work all over the Midwest, and we're seeing that all over. The water demand has just dropped. There's a lot of reasons for that. It all started around the uh, recession. Uh, there's been a lot of foreclosures. Uh, everybody's using much better, uh, efficient water fixtures now. And people also are sensitive because of the, uh, the economy, and people aren't uh, watering as much as they used to. So as a result, the maximum day here in Wheeling has decreased more than 50%. So
So what we're saying is based on what we're seeing right now, and we don't, it looks like it'll keep going down for a while instead of going up. There's about a half a million gallons a day that we could use right now for additional customers. Mm -hmm. And again, as I showed, there's a lot of different things you can do uh, and still uh, be within that half million gallons on those 85 acres. The other thing that the village has been doing for years now is anything in the northwest area of village, it is expected that the developer will pay for the pumps to increase his water pressure. So that's the conclusion of what I have to say. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Can I follow sure, up on a couple ahead. things? Cool. This may come up, so just to get ahead of it. Um, <clears throat> when, and thank you, Mike. When, uh, when going through this analysis, all of the things, that the trend lines that we see as far as water usage and everything, um, we all agreed that those look to be permanent changes. Uh, yes, there are foreclosures in town, but the way people consume water is very different. And I don't just mean we each, you know, use less water. It's a matter of efficiencies. The, the fixtures have been replaced. They're not going to get less efficient. They're going to be more efficient. Uh, the village just went through a several million dollar water meter replacement program. Those meters are more efficient and they're never going to become less efficient. So all of the, the changes that we talked about when looking at uh, current usage we expect to be permanent, not just short-term solutions. Uh, because when we brought this to you, we didn't want you to make a decision for today. We want this to be the right decision for the future. Um, and again, we own the studies. The, the design of the Northwest Pressure Zone exists. There it is. It's always been there. It's been an unfunded project. All we're asking, just so that you can formulate your questions, is that we remove it from the unfunded programs because we collectively recognize that there's no need for it. Um, as Mike stated, uh, Target, Walmart, Sam's all built their own, well, they installed their own pumps in order to deal with the water pressure in the area. Since what we're really talking about is that single 85 acre piece, there's no reason to expect that whomever develops that area for whatever they develop it for would be held to the same standard. So if that's the case, the question becomes why would the village then pay $10 million in order for a developer not to pay a substantially less amount to install a pump to deal with the pressure problems. So I just wanted to add those uh, before questions. Just before I ask for any questions, Jeff, Jack, you want to add anything to it? Anything we missed? I just got one question to you guys real quick. You know, all these years I was always under the impression where that water tower is on that site, that the elevations weren't properly not right or the location isn't right. How does this affect anything regarding the northwest water pressure that we're trying to do over there? And come up to the mic. Please. Answer that, please. I think it's the number six. Yeah. yeah. Come on up here, guys, because we've got the audio. I'd be happy to talk about that. Where it is now is fine, but if we make that as part of the northwest pressure zone, again, what I said was we we're going to basically put a fence between the regular water system and the northwest, then we're going to pump up. So if we did that, that tank would not be tall enough anymore because right. of the added pressure. So we basically would have to raise it about, I think, 20 feet, something like that. And again, it's fine to where it is, but if, if we're going to do a, a different pressure zone around it, then we need it higher. How would it affect any future development on that site, the way it is? The, the way it is right now, it's fine? The it way it is it'll, right it'll now, support it's fine. Development on that site, the way it is right now? Yes. Okay. But again, about a half a million gallons per day. Okay. Because again, this is about pressure. No, I understand. If it, the argument, the discussion about incentivizing development through the installation of infrastructure is separate from this. We're talking about pressure in that area. Well, having just the commodity be... there for it. Right. Cor exactly. <laughs> exactly. Torsty Brady, any comments? What's the relation between pressure and volume <clears throat> when it comes to this? Um, really and truly, we have all the volume we need. Um, again, the reason why we have a problem at the Northwest is ground elevation. So you have to pump up so you lose pressure.
but volume-wise, uh, with your uh, allocation from IDA, IDNR, you have plenty of volume. And the only other thing is, what do we have that's getting ready to be built there, really? Well, nothing on the books now, but what we want to do is remove it from our liabilities. We want to remove it from the unfunded project list of, uh, we didn't want to leave it hanging here with, with you guys as an unfunded project. If we all recognize that it was simply an unnecessary project, we want to clear the books of it and the expectation from the board of it. Well, I so, think you wanted to eliminate, too, that the, the perception out there that you couldn't build because the water wasn't there in the infrastructure. You know, there is infrastructure that needs to be dumped, but absolutely. there is water capacity. And I, I probably, I probably saw him and realizing that there could be something that go in there would would put us short of water, but uh, you know that particular entity would have to realize that we would have to make some uh, you know changes to, to accommodate them. We just don't have the availability there. Uh, whatever happened at uh, Northwest Water Commission's two million gallon tower that they, uh, you know, tower tank that they're going to put next to ours back in there someplace? Our new one. I don't know. I think that's what I was talking about. They were talking about replacing number six with a new tank that they were looking to and acquire it, property <laughs> over there by Northwest Community Health Center or <clears throat> by the Stamella's property. I know we're looking at different elevations, higher elevations than oh. where number six is at now. And they're going to put another another tank next to it heading into Buffalo Grove. Um, the commission was looking at a couple different sites. They had a different tank. Uh, they went out west with their tank, they did. I believe. Mike, yes. Mike? They did. Yes, it's a 5 million gallon stamp pipe that's going to be at uh, 53 and uh, uh, the Comet right away there. Right by the cemetery? In Palatine? Yes. By the cemetery. Okay. Now, you know, through, there's a whole different um, scenarios, you know, when you look at the system as a whole. And uh, one of the scenarios is, uh, uh, of ours is, is, is an additional tank up at the north end of town to be installed at some later date, North Station, uh, North, Northgate Parkway. Whether or not we ever need that one, or whether, if, that, if that ever comes to fruition, I don't know. But those, you know, those are options down the road. But to, to spend the money and run a transmission main down Lake Hook Road now, I, I, I just, I don't see it. Well, Tony brings up a very good point because what we're really talking about is we're not saying that there won't need to be improvements to the water system in, in general, just maintenance, expansion, whatever. What this is really about is that transmission main that would need to be installed down Lake Cook Road, down the back side of Sam's Club Walmart that then led to that 85 acre property. That's what we're talking about. So just to be clear, by no means are we saying that we're done with the water system, we don't need to deal with it. What we're saying is we don't need that transmission main expansion. You know, maybe we should start concentrating on a replacement program, get rid of that cast iron pipes that went out there in the middle of winter time, you know, trying to replace broken water mains. I think we've been aggressive with yeah. that. Very aggressive the last couple of years. Yeah. Well, Extremely aggressive, you. Mark. Yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah. I just got Mary, do you have anything? I don't have any questions. Bob? So you're telling us that basically that area can be developed without any future problems. <clears throat> you, you can get, again, about a half million gallons a day of additional development without any... And how important is that transmission line? Because they're going to be doing work along Lake Cook Road, and would, if we need it in the future, why wouldn't we explore going after it now instead of having to dig up the road or do whatever we need to do at a later date, if we're going to need that line? Well, that is ex that's an excellent question. That's exactly what staff was asking ourselves when we started this analysis. Um, and the conclusion is we don't think we will ever need that line. I just hope we're right. Well, again, as I told staff, there's other things we can do. We can uh, have these package uh, pump stations. Uh, we've done that in many municipalities, Glenview, Bloomington, where you create a pressure district the same way, but on a much smaller scale. And you just pump from this side to the other side. And again, depending on, again, the water usage is so much less now than it was back 
then, um, we could do that on a much smaller scale and, and, and serve the same purpose. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Hang? I'm fine. Trustee Lang? Yeah, well, I mean, why spend it if we don't think we're going to need it? So, I mean, I would, I would the same question that um, Trustee here had about Lake Cook Road is being torn up, perfect opportunity, but still doesn't seem necessary. And, and for the, it's funny, the conclusion of this is that we don't really need to do anything is rare. <coughs> usually, usually it's, you're looking at, okay, we studied this, now we gotta do something about it. Right. So it, it's, it's rare that what you're asking seems a little confusing, but I get your point. I just have one question. If by chance that 85 acres were to get developed and they needed a half million gallons per day, would that jeopardize any other development throughout the community that would need possibly a half a million gallons a day? It's about a half a million gallons a day for the whole village of what is available. So based, we're eliminating ourselves to the northwest quadrant. Based, based on what's the, the water demand right now. If it keeps going down, well, then you'll have that much more. But if it keeps on going up because of development, then what happens? And we got a problem. Well, again, we got about a half a million there, pressure-wise. Could we get more on the east side? Probably could, because again, the, the uh, elevations are lower, and again, volume's not the issue. It's pressure. it's uh, pressure at the higher elevations. Can we look into that, John? Because I I would hate. In the perfect world, if we had development there and development on Milwaukee Lake Cook and development by the airport and development all over the place here, are we going to have a problem supplying water, not just water, but the pressure to accommodate those developments? That's a concern. That's an excellent question. Um, as far as the pressure goes, the, I, I think those are excellent questions separate and apart from the northwest pressure zone. Right. But they all work kind of hand in hand. If that happens up north, what happens to the east? What happens to the south? What happens to Kmart? What happens to everything, right? That's a big concern. Well, does anyone else want to? So I'm not. The I mean, one I'm not looking for an answer tonight, but maybe we you guys have. can explore it if you don't have the answer tonight. That's fine. Well, I think the answer is um, what Mike, Mike said. Um, it, we have enough pressure in this area, we have enough water. So if, if there is an issue with pressure in the future somewhere, there are things we can do to increase pressure in areas. Let's say. Um, Let's say Dundee Road corridor, um, for some reason, saw you know 100,000 or 200,000 square feet of office. And, uh, something can be done to increase the pressure in that area. It's not it's not a water volume problem. It might be a pressure issue, and there are things you can do that we can do to increase pressure in certain areas of the village to allow development or to improve pressure. Same as the industrial park to the south. Industrial anyway. park, yes. Um, doing this in this area or not putting the, 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 the piping in uh, for the Northwest Pressure Zone, as we're suggesting, is not going to do anything relative to development in those areas as long as we realize that we might have to do something in the future to increase pressure somewhere. Okay. If your question is about allocation, we can absolutely get you a, a response to that. We'll put something in writing for you. Whereas, does the Village of Wheeling have enough allocation to serve the 85 acres, the Kmart's, the industrial, oh, the vacancies in the industrial. We can, we can put something together to answer that question. I'm sorry, Ken? Yeah, you know what, I was just thinking, you mentioned that the water use has been down the past few years. Look at the, look at the precipitation the last few years. It's been huge. Nobody's ever had, I haven't had to water my gardens in two years. Right. And I think that's, that's kind of pretty much the, the, the way it's been going. Now what's gonna happen if we get two years of, of dry weather? We studied 26 years. 26 years? And, and the analysis of the... It's been going down for 26 years? Well, not down for 26 years, but we looked at 26 years oh. so you could see trends and all. Um, but as, as Mike said, that this uh, decrease in water usage is far more regional than just the village of Wheeling, and it's the efficiencies that everyone is putting in place from both the municipal side and the individual residential side. That's true, I mean, it's a great point. You're always gonna see fluctuations because in dry years, people are gonna you know, water their lawns, they're gonna use water that way, but um, it's the permanent efficiencies that are making the biggest difference. How about overall, the entire village? You're talking about total usage. You know, as, as we develop things all over town, there's gotta come a point where, you know, 
we're going to be starting to drop the pressure, whatever it is, to, and, and we can provide more water. Can we provide it with the, the proper pressure to service everything, the, the outskirts? Well, Director Janik, I think, said it. We'll, we'll have to address those needs as development comes in, and there are solutions to creating more pressure to support that development. I, I think the thing that we're, I'm concerned about is our allocation of water. Mm -hmm. If everything were to happen all at once or in the next five years, do we have enough water to supply and, and to give those developments or companies or industry or whatever? You gotta look at the type That's of business. I, years ago, I built, I built a, a job not too far from the hospital in, uh, in uh, Mount West, uh, Carpentersville area, whatever, their water tower was on a hill next to a hospital. We were on the, the, the east, east end of the, uh, the community, or was that uh, everywhere? Anyways, it was a restaurant. Everything was fine, plenty of water, until they went to use a dishwasher. You couldn't flush a toilet, you couldn't do anything. It, it just sucked the, the line dry. Right. You know, now, what do you do there? Now, this, they're trying to operate a business that's too late. I mean, you know, I don't know they, what they, the outcome of it was. I mean, we weren't okay. responsible for it, but nevertheless, the village was responsible for it, and they had to do something about it quick. And we don't want to put ourselves in that position. This, this discussion, this decision would not put us in that, in that situation. Mm. I can get you a written response on your question. Okay. Anybody else? Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, fellows. Official communication, Trustee Lang. Thank you. Uh, I was made aware of a, a pretty uh, nice program lately uh, or, or that's been going on. It's... Um, uh, of all names, Prospect Heights uh, chapter of the Dollars for Scholars. Uh, it's a program that I think Wheeling should really get involved in uh, um, from what I've heard. The uh, Prospect Heights name is a little misleading to this program because it benefits Wheeling students as well. Uh, they have um, included many Wheeling High School students in this program over the years. In fact, uh, uh, 20 Wheeling residents have benefited uh, with awards of $89,000 since 2009. So that's a lot of funding for uh, scholarship money for students. Um, and that's, uh, uh, 2009 is the first year that Wheeling, that Prospect Heights included Wheeling students. Their program has been going on since 1989. Um, you're breaking down the amount, uh, $79,000 has been paid out already. And there's still 10,000 yet to be paid over a three-year scholarship for the, and it's the Charles E. Priester four-year award. Um, five students have benefited so far from the four-year award. So that's, uh, that's, that's quite an award that this is, uh, that the scholarship program is uh, giving to our residents. And this doesn't include the Prospect Heights residents portion. This is just our figures. Um, so after discovering these benefits, uh, I approached the Prospect Heights folks and, and asked what Wheeling could do to help promote this a little bit more, and they were quite ecstatic about that. Uh, their Dollars for Scholars, that's a national program, and, and they're just a chapter of it. They're willing to drop the Dollars for Scholars name to it and kind of combine a Wheeling Prospect Heights or, or area program to benefit students, definitely more students from Wheeling with this program. Uh, some of the things they're asking from us are pretty simple. Uh, they want the village board to get excited about this, the residents to get excited about this and support the program. Uh, and as the village board talk about the benefits of it to businesses and uh, when you start building a support base. Um, there's a nominal donation from the Village of Wheeling, and, and that's something that isn't budgeted for, but you know, we can look at that as well. Uh, promotion on our website, simple enough to do. And then the ability for that group to tap some Wheeling businesses for donations as well and, and involvement in this organization. Um, there's a, a video I have uh, from the organization. Now, it still says Prospect Heights to it, so, you know, it's a current video that they're using, mm -hmm. and uh, Luca has that. Okay. Good night. <laughs> it's a half hour. <laughs> <laughs> In 1958, Dr. Irving Fratkin of Fall River, Massachusetts, asked everyone in town to give just $1 to an education fund, or dollars for scholars. 
that would allow nearly every student in that community to attend college. Since then, Dollars for Scholars has become the nation's largest nonprofit, private sector scholarship <coughs> and educational support organization, Scholarship America, with more than 1,000 volunteer-driven Dollars for Scholars chapters, giving more than $2.9 billion to 1.9 million students across the country through its programs. Prospect Heights Dollars for Scholars, founded in 1998 at the urging of Mayor Ed Rochford, serves students living in Prospect Heights and Wheeling. The scholarship program is open to high school seniors, homeschool students, and college undergraduates looking to attend a university, college, or vocational school. Recipients are selected on four criteria, academic achievement, financial need, school activities and community service, and a written essay. We're in our 15th year of doing scholarship, the scholarship program. Uh, annually, we currently give seven scholarships to uh, deserving students in the area. We have a special scholarship called the Nick Taramani Award that goes to students who are attending vocational schools, so not your traditional four-year university setting. I feel that the Prospect Heights Dollars for Scholars uh, scholarships that we give to the students in our area opens doors to allow those students to gain an education that they might not otherwise have. In our case, the main struggle is the finance because we have four children and we don't know how far our credit limit can go. I learned about the Prospect Heights Dollars for Scholars scholarship program through my high school. They had a list of scholarships that you could be eligible for and I found it and I applied for it. The biggest thing that has really helped me through the scholarship is just the release of, of worry and apprehension for my future. Well, we're a family of low resources so we know it's going to be hard to come up with the money for school. 100% of the money raised by Prospect Heights Dollars for Scholars goes towards scholarships. Seven $2,500 academic or vocational one-year scholarships are awarded, and also the Charles E. Priester Four-Year Renewable Scholarship, a $10,000 scholarship, is given annually to one of our community's most outstanding students, with over $176,000 awarded to more than 83 students. The success of the chapter was recognized in 2010 when it was selected Illinois Chapter of the Year by Scholarship America. You know, students are taking on an incredible amount of debt load uh, in order to be able to afford their college choice uh, so they can pursue their dreams. They're excited and, and at that time they're really not thinking about uh, how they're going to go about paying that debt once they graduate. Community-based scholarship programs are the most direct way people who can't afford to be generous in our community give back to other people. You can look at all these different scholarships that are awarded and some are faceless and you never really meet the people that awarded the scholarship. The one thing that's unique about the Dollars for Scholars local chapter is that it's people we know. It's phenomenal when you get involved and you see just how special these young people are. If we help them, what we hope is that they will come back and give that same kind of assistance in the future when they're able to. Average student loan debt of 2011 college undergraduates is more than $26,000 and total loans outstanding exceed $1 trillion. Americans now owe more on student loans than on credit cards. The financial support Prospect Heights Dollars for Scholars provides helps lighten that burden and gives students the opportunity to pursue their educational dreams. Being a recipient for the Dollars for Scholars has really helped me with my career and my college goals. Now thanks to the Dollars for Scholars I can achieve my goals of finishing being the first one in the family to complete college. And just how much they've shown that they care about me not just as a student but as a human being who they feel and I feel can really be something in this world.
sorry, a little lengthy, but no, it's good. Yeah, you know, it. Good. Uh, it you see all the wheeling references in there as well, and it's uh, um, it Brady. Um, so anyway, it, it's a uh, it, it seems like a good program. It doesn't take any staff uh, involvement on our part; just uh, really support. And uh, so you know, I, and it's a great win. It's another situation where we're working with one of our neighboring communities to do something. Good for and benefiting, residents and benefiting their residents here. Absolutely, I know a lot of them are uh, from Wheeling and Wheeling High School, and, and it's, I've gone to golf outings, I've gone to affairs, and they, it, it's neat to see the businesses come back and give to the community and believe in these young people today. Uh, we saw Mr. Lo Dr. Lopez there and everything else. I mean, and what we've gone through at Wheeling High School and, and seeing the change of what's going on there with manufacturing. <laughs> And what we're, we're promoting as a village with man, the manufacturers and the students, and giving them that opportunity to go to a vocational school or a trade, you know, trade school other than a college, and, and really helping these kids. And, and you know what? Let's talk about that Saturday at the budget. Maybe come up with some dollar amount with Manager Fondillas, and we'll try to get our consensus on Saturday and put some money in the, a little bit of money in the budget to get our feet wet, and uh, and more important, support it. Well, that's the big thing is you know, support. Work with the chamber, support it. Work with us, support yeah. it. And uh, I think it's a great idea. I really do. Thank you. That's all. Did you have some comments to make before the you had a vid before the video went on? Did you want to say something? I thought you were going to say something. Ken? Oh, what do you? No, about this. I no, I'm glad, looking to talk. I'm glad he brought it. You know, I get that notice in the mail every year, and I, I thought it was just another golf outing. I don't go. Mm -hmm. So, but now uh, you see it in a little different light. Really. Very okay. good. Thank you, Ray. Thanks, Ray. Trustee Hind. Thank you. Um, I had asked the uh, police department uh, through manager Fondolis to do a little traffic study on Dundee Road over by Walgreens and Willie and so on and so forth uh, relative to uh, pedestrians being hit by vehicles. And in that investigation, we found that uh, uh, there were three... Uh, three crashes uh, with minor injuries in a year and a half. Uh, but also what came to light uh, in that investigation was the fact that our number one crash area in the village of Wheeling is at Willie and also coming, uh, making a left turn onto Dundee Road and Walgreens making a left turn onto Dundee Road. And uh, I would like to uh, have Mr. Fondillis and his staff do a little more research into this and to come up with some suggestions. Uh, they're suggesting that we eliminate left turns at Willie and left turns at uh, coming out of Walgreens. But also most, Im most important is to utilize some of the egresses we have going out of that area by Walgreens where you can go back onto Milwaukee Avenue and go southbound from there, and you can go northbound on Milwaukee Avenue. Uh, it would be a much safer passageway to do that. So perhaps maybe our staff at the police department can do a little more investigation <clears throat> and some, some concrete answers and some education and some signage over there, uh, especially on the north end of the Walgreens parking lot where they do go out by Benihana uh, so on and so forth. I noticed that they have uh, striping in their parking lot and it's <coughs> faded out a little bit and a couple of signs are missing. So maybe we can do something about that. At the entranceway going into <coughs> a Milwaukee place, is that where you're talking about where the strip center is? Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah, it is bad, Mark. And I understand a study has been done and it does warrant a signalization there at Wheeling Avenue and Dundee Road. So I think the question to staff is, what's the next step? We I just found one, we right. just found that information out today, and it appears that it does the traffic study. And I'm not mincing words. Right. Uh, until IDOT agrees, it, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, however, the traffic study that was done at Wheeling Avenue and Dundee uh, does show, according to Cloa, who did the traffic study, that the warrants are met for a traffic signal there. The next steps then would be to present that traffic study to IDOT have them uh, weigh in and hopefully concur. 
then go to the Northwest Municipal Conference for uh, grant monies. Those are normally 80-20 splits. Conservatively, we're thinking, uh, we're estimating about $300,000 for uh, an intersection installation there. Uh, again, that's conservative, but those are the next steps and we're going to pursue present, presenting the traffic study to IDOT. John, can I ask, do uh, you think a full, full four-way stop-and-go light there, or are we talking about a pedestrian light? A full signalized intersection. A block away from Milwaukee Avenue? It's yeah. far enough away. It would be right at McDonald's. And we're going to have one out here. We don't have to worry about getting to the railroad tracks going west. <laughs> Well, and remember, the board asked for a third study, which is uh, which occurred last week at Cedar and Dundee, uh, with regards to the London Bridge. That study, we don't have the uh, results, but last Tuesday, that study was conducted as well. We don't, we do not expect that one to show warrants being met for a traffic signal there. However, it was done uh, in order to answer the question: What are we doing with the London Bridge? Well, I, I thought the, the biggest concern at, at Wheeling Avenue and Dundee was pedestrians, not not car traffic. Car traffic will take care of itself. It's the pedestrians that are in trouble there, you know. It's both. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Brady, you're up. Anything uh, else? I just one question. I, you know, I noticed in accruals, uh, we're still paying some handsome money to a Waterworks Limited for new water meters. When is that program going to be done? Jeff, come on up here, please. It's 99.9% done, <clears throat> done. Excuse me. Um, the last invoice should be paid this week. There's probably about 100 water meters left to be installed, but those are vacancies and people who haven't uh, responded to the letters, and we'll do the remainder of those in-house. We'll, we'll be able to start operating? Yes. The system? Yes. And without those 100? Yes. Right, good. That's all I need to know. Thank you. Trustee Kruger. Thank you. Um, I wasn't going to say anything, but I rarely get this opportunity because um, Tony, Mark, Jeff, and John, and John are here all at the same time. So I'm going to publicly thank all of you for the work that we did together on working with Buffalo Grove on the Jackson Basin, because I get to drive by all the work that they're doing every day for the last two weeks and hope that my little beetle's going to get around the big piles of stone, but I made it, and uh, I got to meet uh, the engineer for Buffalo Grove. I know his name is Mark. Last name starts with a B, but I don't remember what his name is. But uh, super, super nice gentleman, and I thanked him, and he was candid enough with me to tell me that, you know, they didn't expect to see what they've seen so far, but they're working through it. The pipe's in, in front of the basin. You know, I can visualize now what, what's going to happen there, and I think it's a great I'm glad that they did it, and I'm glad that we all worked together and you guys worked with them to get that. It's just, I just want to thank you for that. And then I guess I'll take the opportunity to say again, lights around Wheeling, 4.30, Sunday, November 23rd. Show up, bring your kids. That's it. Thanks. Trustee here. Sure, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to comment. Nice new look on the uh, TV with the uh, village channel. I really like that. It looks very nice. Thank you. Um, so thanks, uh, Luca, and the rest of the crew. Uh, and thank Mark Janik. I don't know if you had anything to do with it, but I've seen over the last couple of days at Dunkin' Donuts here on Dundee Road, right at that intersection of Wheeling Road and Dundee Road, where they've redone the, um, the parking lot. They have a guy standing out there now with some pylons trying to uh, navigate the customers around the building instead of staging out on uh, Wheeling Road. I don't know how it's working. Um, sometimes he looks a little frustrated, but uh, <laughs> have you heard back from them? Uh, no, we have not. Uh, I, think th I think that's the beginning of their educational process with, uh, with some, of their, um, client, uh, some of their customers. Well, thank you very much, though. We're working on it. Yeah, appreciate it. That's it. Clerk Simpson. Um, Remember tomorrow, Tuesday, November 4th, to go out and vote if you haven't voted already. Your vote does count. Your candidate may not get elected, but you will have the satisfaction of voting 
for your choice. If you are unsure of your polling location, please contact Deputy Clerk Lisa at 847-499-9085 or visit www.cookcountyclerk.com. And the Wheeling Garden Club on November 12th, which is next Wednesday, will be hosting a, a gentleman by the name of Steve Cook is going to do a presentation on the correct way of planting bulbs. And it's at the Senior Center on 199 First Street, and it starts at 7 p.m. Do you want me to repeat the? Sure. Um, the Village Annual Lighting Ceremony, Lights Around Wheeling, will take place on Sunday, November 23rd, with Mr. and Mrs. Santa arriving at Friendship Park in a horse-driven carriage at 4.30 p.m. Stop by for some hot cocoa, a snack, and a visit with Santa, and witness the beautiful lights turning on to mark the beginning of the holiday season. And I saw you testing them and they look really pretty. Yeah, thanks. That's it. Andrew Svandilos? I have nothing this evening, thank you. I got a couple things. I'm gonna start off with you, Chief. Woke up this morning about four o'clock, turned on the news, and I see truck 23 in Prospect Heights with a horrible fire there. Any, everything okay? Are guys okay? I can't hear you, Chief. <laughs> Everything's fine. And then this afternoon, there was a car fire over at Strong in Milwaukee Avenue. Today was a day of fires around here. Everything's fine. That's good. <laughs> you look tired, Chief. I saw you on TV, too, uh, giving directions. So, good job with the guys. That's good. Uh, just a couple things. London Bridge looks good. Looks very, well, it looks very nice. Looks really nice. I believe they, were they out there? It's done. It's done. No, they, they were supposed to come out and do one more coat. Oh, maybe, but it looks great. Nice and clean, clean finish. Looks Thank nice you. job. For a lot less money than what we had thought. So uh, yeah. Good job. Uh, cable stations, again, I'll echo Trustee Here's comments. Uh, if anybody hasn't seen 17 or 99, check it out. It's a new look. And uh, just started about a week ago, so we're going to see better and bigger things on that. So that's a, that's a positive thing. I'm happy about that. We are having our uh, annual budget meeting Saturday, 830 here at Village Hall. All are welcomed. Uh, should be an interesting meeting. I'm looking forward to that. And uh, happy to report that uh, we took the first steps with uh, Director Wiesar, Managers Fondillas, Trustee Brady, myself, members of the Park uh, District, Mr. Webby, Jan Bukes, and uh, President uh, Pekka, and along with uh, Commissioner Stein. And uh, staff is working now. It's in the hands of Sherry and uh, Matt Webby to uh, get our consultant together and, and looking at opportunities here for our new senior center along with the park district here at the campus. So we are moving forward with that and I'm happy to report hopefully in another 45, 60 days that we'll have something that we can bring back to the board. So this is all positive, good cooperation, intergovernment agreements, working together as a group, uh, which is important, not only to me, but to this community and this board. So I'm happy to see that moving forward. And again, uh, at the budget meeting. So <laughs> that'll be interesting and uh, looking forward to that. We do have executive session. Oh, approval of the bills first for October 2nd through the 29th, 2014. Entertain a motion. So moved. Motion by Trustee Kruger. Second. Second by Trustee Lang. Roll call, please. Trustee Kruger. Yes. Trustee Lang. Yes. Trustee Brady. Yes. Trustee Heer. Yes. Trustee Hine. Yes. Prisoner Juris. Yes, thank you. We do have executive session this evening for review and approval of minutes of executive sessions lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act. The setting of a price for sale or lease of property owned by the public body and pending probable and or imminent litigation. I entertain a motion. So, so moved. Move. Motion by Trustee Hine, second by Trustee Lang. Roll call, please. Trustee Kruger? Yes. Trustee Lang? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. Trustee Heer? Yes. Trustee Hine? Yes. Prisoner Juris? Yes. We'll go into executive session, say, at uh, 8.30. Thanks.